Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we do lend our spirits to the spirit of the living God within us, that out through the vessel of our being, you pour forth your wisdom with mighty clarity. We do thank you for we have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of that spirit that you've so richly given to us in redemption. I will thank you for we believe and receive that the burden of ignorance is dematerialized, that the teaching of your word goes forward with clarity tonight to your glory, and everybody says, Amen. Well, again, uh, we will continue with our conversations in current, and uh, you will just go quickly together uh, to First Corinthians, our text, uh, and that is First Corinthians and uh, chapter 1. Okay, First Corinthians and chapter 1 and verse one okay very quickly we'll go there together and uh, we'll have some good times together in the word of god tonight it says paul called to be an apostle of jesus christ through the will of god and sustains our brother okay unto the church of god which is at current to them that are sanctified in christ jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of jesus christ our lord both dears and ours uh, and it says, uh, I want to see it again. It then goes to verse 10 and says, Now I beseech you, brethren. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It says that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment judgment now i want you to see what paul said in second corinthians yeah very quickly second corinthians and uh, chapter two yeah it says second corinthians and chapter two it says in verse 12 furthermore when i came to troas to preach christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me of the lord i had no rest in my spirit because i found not titus my brother Okay, so Paul referred to Titus as my brother. Now, and, and yet, if you look at Titus and chapter 1, it says in Titus and chapter 1, in verse 4, to Titus, my own son. So Titus was a son, yeah, in the faith to Paul. But when Paul is going to refer to him, uh, when talking to, uh, about him to others, yeah, he says, uh, Titus, my, uh, my brother, right? Second Corinthians and chapter two, uh, it says, I had no rest in my spirit. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. You know, there should be people that are that way to you in your life. Yeah, it says, I found no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. That means the brotherhood was that important to Paul. I found no rest. Now, second, second Peter, second Peter and chapter three, you go all the way down to verse uh, 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, as written unto you. So Peter, right, magnified the brotherhood that he shared with Paul. He says, our beloved brother Paul. Look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16. Are you there? It says in verse 12, as touching our brother Apollos. Yeah, as touching our brother Apollos. I, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will, look at it carefully, but his will uh, was not at all to come at this time. Okay, so uh, he, he referred to Apollos as our brother. So he was a brother to Paul, a brother to the whole church at Corinth, just like he referred to Titus as uh, my brother Titus. Sincerely, if you are in the Corinthian church, you will have been blown away with Paul's phenomenal revelation and conduct and understanding of brotherhood. It says in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 12, as touching our brother Apollo, I greatly desire him to come unto you with the brethren, yeah, so with the brethren, but his will was not to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. You know, I, I don't know about you. Did you see the clarity it, with the way that Paul wrote there? You know, uh, what happened? Paul wanted Apollos to come at a particular time, but Apollos was not willing to come at that time. 
right? And that was why Apollos did not come with the other brethren that came to Corinth. Very easy. So what does that mean? It means that the people in Corinth will have been asking questions. Oh, why didn't Apollos come with them? Is there a problem? Is there an issue? Is there a problem here or there? Whatever the case was. And what did Paul do? Paul addressed the issue as on. That's the local church. In the local church, we don't do things mysteriously. Yeah, Apollos did not come with the other ministers or the brethren when they came. And Paul thought it fit to explain to the Corinthians. Why? Because we are a brotherhood. And look at Paul's explanation. He did not, he did not make it, you, you know, if you read that, you will almost think, is this Paul spiritual at all? Right? You know, because many of us will have said instead mm, that uh, we, we, we were seeking the face of the Lord and we were led in our spirits and we will have given it all manner of uh, explanations. Paul, Paul just called it what it was. I wanted him to come. He was not willing to come yet. He will come at a convenient time. <laughs> Very easy. You see, brotherhood gives us such a beautiful platform for speaking the truth in love. Look at it again. First Corinthians 16, 12. As touching our brother Apollos. I love that. He calls him our brother Apollos. Look at First Corinthians and chapter uh, 1. Yeah, chapter 1. And uh, verse... Uh, uh, verse 11, for it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you said, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Then Paul said, actually, is Christ divided? Was Christ crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Notice, Paul didn't say, what? What are you doing with so many ministers? No, no, no. It just says, is Christ divided for you? The trouble was not that it was Peter and Paul and Apollos and, and all that. No. The problem was that they were actually contentious. You see, contentious people take a gift or take the men that God has given us as gifts and they turn it into a contentious matter. Men are gifts. Let me say it again. Men are gifts given in the resurrection of Jesus and they are gifts to the extent that they reveal Jesus. A man who does not reveal Jesus but reveals everything else but Jesus Christ is not a gift to the local church. He could be a believer, all right. Right, it could even be a minister, but he is not ministering correctly because uh, we uh, we are gifts to the extent that we reveal Jesus, that we reveal Jesus, we reveal brotherhood, we reveal the others one another. But I want to see something here. The Corinthians were the ones that were contentious. How are they contentious? How do contentious brethren speak? Are they contentious brethren? Can somebody be a believer? be a Christian, be a saint, be born again, be a product of the resurrection and be contentious. Yes. Right? Now, how, how do contentious people speak? He says, well, they say things like, ah, me, I am of Paul. Another person says, no, 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 I'm of Apollos. Or somebody says, no, I'm of Olati. Another one says, no, I'm of Seku. Now, that's, uh, and then, of course, if Seku and Olati are immature, they take it to heart. And I say, eh, so you, you are for Olati, you are not for me. Now, that would be, that would be Seku and Olati needing their head to be put in the proper place. Right? Instead, when you are Paul and somebody says around you, I'm of Paul, what do you do to that kind of person? You say, ah, is Christ divided? You don't say, hey, hey, that's solidarity. No, no. You say, is Christ divided? Why? Because that kind of language, right, will cause trouble among the brethren. It is not a, see, contention is not an inheritance in Christ. You know, let me say it again. It says, now this I say, 1 Corinthians 1.12, this I say that every one of you say it. I am of Paul. You know, uh, so they thought, ah, that when Paul hears them say, I'm of Paul, they will say, eh, uh -huh. he will tell them, oh, look at those guys. They are faithful brethren. They have given to solidarity. No, Paul's answer was, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? So you know what, how could you say I'm of Paul? When Paul was not crucified for you. You understand? Now, that is the way that a mature minister deals with those kind of stuff. Will Christians try to be contentious when it comes to receiving men as gifts? Yes. Right, what does the minister do? The minister does not play partisan, cultic, or all, all those kind of clicky kind of uh, things with the saints. The minister magnifies Christ, starts from the revelation of Jesus. So, even when they were saying, I'm of Paul, he said, Ah, uh, is Christ divided? You get the point, is Christ divided now? And he said, Ah, thank God I didn't baptize any of you. In other words, you cannot say you learned this from me. That's what Paul is saying, right? So, now then Paul then goes on in chapter 3. Yeah, it then says in uh, chapter 3 and verse uh, 3, 
for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy, strife, divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? In other words, men that are contentious or saints that are cliquey, saints that are into cliques, right? Uh, before long, they are into envy and into strife and into divisions and into carnality and the walk as men. He says, for while, how do you, how, how do those kind of people speak? For while one said, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Now, you know that language is the same language of 1 Corinthians and chapter 1 and verse 12. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. And he said his answer is Christ divided. In 1 Corinthians 3, it says, actually, do you know what? Uh, if you talk that way, it says, uh, while one said, I'm of Paul, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 3, 4, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? In other words, it is an act of division or an act of carnality to say, ah, me, oh, I am for that person, or me, I am not for, no, no, we are a brotherhood. We don't go into personality cliques. Will there be people that you actually get along better with in the local church? Of course. Why? Because we're human beings. But we don't go into the confession, I am for, I am of. No. No, we don't do that. We are brethren. That's our language. We are brethren. For why one said, I'm of Paul? Now, remember, Paul is the one writing this. See, when Paul heard people say, I am of Paul, Paul didn't pat them on the back and say, ah, oh, that's a faithful guy. No. He says, you are kind of. Now think about this carefully. Uh, imagine you were one of the Corinthians and you walked up to Paul and you said, I'm a Paul. Paul would have patted you on the back and said, what? You are carnal. Are you not carnal? Verse 5. Then he would say, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. In other words, these men are gifts. And they are given to you to be a blessing to you. Who then is Apollos? Paul will say, eh, hey. you see, ah, well, ah, no, I, everybody needs somebody to be around him. So if you are saying, I'm of Paul, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was almost feeling silly. But now I know that, no. Paul will say, who then is Paul? That's what, that's what a pastor does. Let me tell you. You see, the spirit that makes that, that attitude or slant, that makes a believer say in the local assembly, I am of this person. And that one says, no, me, I'm not of that person. I'm of another person. That same spirit or slant or attitude or mannerism or perspective or conduct will bring about contention and division and strife and all manner of evil work. You see, what later showed up as the trouble in 1 Corinthians 5, as the trouble in 1 Corinthians 7, as a trouble in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, right? And to all the way to the end, started with they, men not knowing how to receive men. You see, God has given us the man, our man, that man, Jesus. We are in receiving him. We receive the men in him. And we don't pick and choose. We receive the men in him. What, our, what is our focus? Is that person preaching Christ? If that person is preaching Christ, oh, excellent stuff. Now, get it right. Am I going to listen to every single person who preaches Christ? No, why? Right? There won't just be enough time, right? But the reason is not, ah, you mustn't listen to so-and-so, or you must not listen to so-and-so. Now, that only breeds contention. So, Paul would say, imagine, although Paul wrote the whole of Corinthians and the whole of Galatians and the whole of Ephesians and the whole of Philemon and Timothy and Titus and all that, the guy said, who is Paul? You know, somebody would have told Paul, Paul, are you sure you want these people to honor you? How can you say, who is Paul? No, tell them, I am Paul the mighty. I was the second born that rose from the dead with Jesus Christ. I was, the one, I was raised from the dead before you guys. I, I was the one that received the revelation inside the revelation. I know the secret behind the secret. You know, I, I magnify my office, but that's not what he said. He said, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? Or ministers. I mean, servants. In other words, it, it, this thing that like you're trying to kill yourself over is a service to be received. It says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man. Verse 6, I have planted. That's what I did. Apollos watered. So Apollos and I are in the work of God. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. In other words, God caused yeah, there to be right, the expression of, of fruitfulness in line with what I ministered and Apollos watered. God brought the increase of what I ministered. Yes, can you see? So he's not saying, oh, I'm a better minister than Apollos or, oh, guys, forget Apollos, listen to me. No. You see, I just said, you know what? I planted. 
Apollos watered. You see, it takes humility for you as a brother to know that God does not leave himself at the mercy of one man. He is the father of the family. And in the family, he has saints. Just like God told Elijah, he said, I have 7,000 men that have not bowed their knees to bow. And Elijah was trying to intercede against Israel. You see, that's the way it is also in the local church. All of us, right, as we grow in the light and we walk in the light and we allow ourselves and our conduct to be dominated by the word of God, we are able to minister to others in that we serve them. So he then says, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? Well, ministers, right? They are servants by whom you believe. I have planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Verse 7, so then, neither is he that planted anything. Wow. Somebody will say, Paul, look, you are not helping these guys understand honor. No, but that is honor. Honor is knowing how to receive men correctly as the gift of God given for edification. Let me say that one more time. Honor, right, is learning how to receive men correctly as the gift of God given to you for your edification so that in their edifying you, you learn to edify others too. That's what it is, right? So it then says in verse 7, 1 Corinthians 3, 7, So then, neither is he that planted anything. Neither is he that water it, but God that gave it the increase. What does a good pastor point the people to? To God, right? He points them to God and helps them understand. When I say points them to God, I mean he helps them understand that the revelation of God in Christ Jesus is what we are about. It's not the man that plants or the man that waters. Does God need men to plant? Yes. Does God need men to water? Yes. But are those men that water the focus? No. Are those men that plant the focus? No. It is God that gives the increase. Right? It is God that gives the increase. Now, but now said in verse 8, now he that planted and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Watch carefully. We receive our rewards according to our labor. I will not receive for Paul's labor. Paul will not receive for my labor. Apollos will not receive for Paul's labor. And Paul will not receive for Apollos' labor. Right? Let me tell you one more time. You see, there is such a thing as the concept of rewards, as the doctrine of rewards. And the doctrine of rewards is a doctrine in Christ that says that men will be rewarded for faithful ministry. Yeah, you and I, we will be rewarded by the Lord for faithful ministry. Why? Verse 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are laborers together with God. So God himself is a laborer. So we are God's husband. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. So the people that I come to, I hold them sacred in my heart. That they are God's husbandry. That means they are God's garden. And they are God's building. They are the house that God built in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do I do? I plant there. And my action of planting is sacred. Now, when you say plant, we're not talking about horticulture. Right? It's a figure of speech referring to the act of ministering the word of God, teaching the word of God. In fact, he said it this way, verse 5. For who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed. Can you see? So the, their act in helping you to believe is what he called planting. And the act in establishing you in that, he calls watering. But he says, neither is he that planted anything or he that watered anything. Wait, that does not mean, oh, that Paul, God is saying, well, people that minister to us are worthless. No, that's not it at all. He's simply saying that we should, that, that he's telling the Corinthians, why are you so caught up on I'm for Paul, I'm for Paulus? You see, he says that is the hallmark of carnality. Now, but the guys will have been saying, oh, in, in 1 Corinthians 1, no, 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 no. We know we are the church of God. We have the revelation of a church. We have the revelation of sanctification. We know justification in Christ Jesus. We know about identification. We know brotherhood. We know, we know, we know. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians 8, they, they will have said, ah, we, we all have knowledge. Yeah, it says, now as certain things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Fine. But their knowledge was actually uh, manifest was being used for carnality. Let me say it again. Bible knowledge can be handled unwisely. Just like Bible knowledge can be handled wisely. Let me say it differently. Revelation knowledge, right? Epignosis can be handled immaturely and epignosis can be handled maturely. It is one thing to have the correct knowledge. It's a different thing to possess that knowledge with edification of people in mind. And very often, the immature person can have the truth, but possess and hold and use the truth in a non-edifying way. 
how are the Corinthians, did the Corinthians have knowledge? Yes, they did. How are they using the knowledge? They were using that knowledge to, for contention, for strife, and all this kind of stuff. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians and chapter 3 and verse 4, why one said, I'm a Paul, and another, I'm a Paulus, are you not canal? Then it goes to chapter 4. Yeah, and then it says in verse 6, and these things, brethren, see, he calls them brethren again. Can you see that this brethren, brother, sister thing is a biggie? Yeah, so, and these things, brethren, I have in the figure, transferred to myself, so the figure of planting, the figure of watering. No, it doesn't mean that uh, Apollos works in the water corporation or that Paul is a farmer. No, it's a figure. So these things, brethren, I have in the figure, transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us. So Paul expected the Corinthians to learn from Paul and to learn from Apollos. Yeah, to learn in us, not to think. So in other words, the greatest thing you, that happens to you when you come in contact with solid ministries is that your thinking is affected. You may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Let me say it again. What is our greatest challenge in the local church? That we think of men above what is written. How does it show up? We, uh, that, that means we think of men above God's word, one, or we elevate men above the word of God, or our allegiance is to men rather than to the word of God, and in the word of God, we learn to relate with men. Let me say it again. Our allegiance should be to God's word, and then in God's word, we are introduced to men, and in God's word, we learn to discern correctly, and then we learn to relate with men properly. But if you don't do it in God's word, and you do it outside God's word, then what's going to happen is going to be, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and then it becomes contention and division. Amen. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I have enough figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us. So Paul expected the Corinthians to learn in Apollos, to learn in Paul. So Paul was not the kind of person that was so cultic. He was saying, no, 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 no. It is me. Send away Apollos. No. They, the Corinthians, were the ones that were cultic, that the ones saying, no, me and Apollo, I'm an Apollos guy. The other person says, no, 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 me, I'm a Paul guy. And I don't care about Apollos, and I don't care about so-and-so, I'm a Paul man. And Paul said, no, that's carnality. See, it looks or sounds spiritual, but it's carnal. Why? Because it is using a gift that God has given to then cause divisions and contentions and demarcations among the saints where they should be known. Now, instead, what should there be when you receive good ministry? Edification. You become more body of Christ conscious. Let me say it again. Anytime that you begin to feel like you are an exclusive group in your local assembly, there's something going wrong, right? We have, you, you come in contact with the knowledge of the truth of God's word, but we are not more special than other believers. Why? We are, we are bought by the one blood, by the one sacrifice, by the one redemption, by the one father, into the one family, and we are called by the same name. Same, same. Yeah, we have one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One. There are not two. Although some Christians may not know what I know or what you know, but yet we understand that in that belief, in the resurrection of Jesus, and in the possession of the one spirit, we are one. Hallelujah. Now, moreover, what do you have that you are not given? You understand? That keeps you humble. So, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, And these things, brethren, I have in the figure transferred to myself and to Apollos, for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. So, men are the gift that God has given to us in redemption. And how we relate to men, one, how we receive men, two, how we learn from men, three, says a lot about us. So, how I receive you as a brother, may not have anything to do with you, has a lot to do with me in my immaturity and carnality. Yeah. So in this case, Apollos and Paul were not the problem. Paul said, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? Now, so Paul and Apollos were not the problem. It's just that people, as a result of the loss of the flesh and immaturity, have a tendency to repeat in the local church the carryover mentality from the secular world. Right? You know, say, ah, no, you tell that manager in the office, me, I'm for you, I'm not for that, that manager. Just remember me in your kingdom. Uh, me, I'm, for that, I'm not for that manager, I'm for this person. You know, th that kind of divisive attitude, we don't bring it into the local church. In the local church, we are brethren. So it says that you may learn in us not to think, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, you may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Now, Paul will not tell the Corinthians 
that if it's not a challenge. So we all have a challenge, which is one, we come to know that men are given in the gift of Christ. Or number one, God became a man. And number two, that man was a sacrifice of God. Number three is that in receiving that man, we find men given to us as gifts. We receive the man Jesus, and in receiving Jesus, men are given to us as gifts. Here's where the trouble starts. We must learn to think of the men, right, and subject our knowledge of men to the written word. <clears throat> whatever you know of people, whatever you learn from people, whatever you know about yourself, you must know it in the light of the written word and subject it to the written word. So 1 Corinthians 4, 6, that you may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up. So in other words, we, can, we get into pride when we elevate men above the word of God. So I do not know how to receive a man as a gift. If firstly, I place the man above the word of God, I don't know, I cannot receive that man as a gift. Although the man himself might not be encouraging me to do that, I will be polluting my heart. So let me say it again. If I elevate a man above the word of God, that is no honor. That's actually dishonor both for the word and the man. Let me say it again. See, Paul said, I have in a figure, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that none of you be puffed up. Watch carefully. Uh, can men, can a believer, can a saint think of a minister and elevate the minister above what is written? Yes. What does Paul call it? Oh no, no, it calls it being puffed up. Let me say that one more time. Let me say that one more time. Let me say that one more time. Paul says, hey, Corinthians, I recognize this in you. You have a tendency to think, think of men above what is written. In other words, you relate to and uh, uh, consider, right, men in a way that you cannot find scripture for, right? In other words, unconsciously, you are... For, uh, you are actually manifesting the commandments of men, in which case you are actually not honorable, you are puffed up. So let me say it again. Honor is learning to receive men and to receive of men where, by subjecting the men and what you received of them to the word of God. One more time. Honor. Yeah. When it comes to honor, you are considering two things, the man and what you receive from the man. What are you doing with that? You are subjecting both the man and what you receive of the man, in this case, teaching or conduct, to the word of God. That is honor. One more time. Honor as men and their influence and the word of God. What do you do? You take the man in your heart and you take the man's influence in your heart and you subject the man and the man's influence to the written word of God. That is honor. I'm going to say that one more time. Honor is yeah, subjecting the men and their influence over you to the written word of God. That is honor. What is this honor? This honor is what, taking men right outside the parameters of the word of God. So, for example, a man comes to me, a Paul comes to Corinth, and he comes to teach, or your pastor is there teaching you the word of God, and you are yawning, and you are sleeping, and you are dozing off. That's dishonor. That's just dishonor, right? Now, uh, what are you doing? You are not receiving from the man. Okay. Now, all, now everybody might understand that I just said now, but this is also dishonor. When my pastor says one thing, and because my pastor has said it, I do not subject it to the word of God. That is dishonor. What, what am I walking in? Uh, somebody, you might have people around you that will say, ah, see or no. But you open the book of 1 Corinthians and Paul will say, no, nope, that's pride. Let me say it again. Pride is often masqueraded as honor. Uh, what other name is it called? Hero worship. That's what it is. Hero worship. What is hero worship? My fearing a man such that I subject the word of God to the man, not the man to the word of God. So it is whatever the man says the word of God is, that's what the word of God is, rather than the word of God introducing me to the man. Somebody says, but men are the ones that teach us God's word. True. 
But when you read God's word, God's word will then tell you that you are not to think of men above what is written. You get it now. So the trouble is not who teaches you the word of God. The trouble is how do I learn to think in line with the word of God? Let me say one more time. Honor, biblical honor. We're talking of scriptural honor. We're talking of local church honor, redemption honor. Let's call it that. The crucicentric honor, right? Yeah. Honor as found in the word of God is a ministry. When a minister sees that people are elevating him above the word of God, he knows that those people elevating him above the word of God are damaging their own heart with pride. So what does he do? He corrects it. He faces it at long. He addresses it. He clarifies it. Why? So that the man can walk in biblical honor. What is biblical honor again? Why? Why honor? You know, many weeks ago, I treated why honor. The reason for honor is so that men can receive the word of God from other men. Because a man that you don't open your heart to, you cannot be blessed by. But that therein lies the danger. If I then elevate the man above the word, you guess what? I cannot receive the word from that man because what I'll be receiving is my uh, pride. Let me say it again. Here is a man, a minister, and uh, that is the word of God. The man comes preaching to me the word of God. I elevate the man above God's word. What is that called? Pride. So what is in my heart? Pride. What will I receive? Pride. In other words, the moment I begin to elevate a man above God's word, I stunt my spiritual growth. I limit my own spiritual progress. Except the man or a leader or another brother beside me points it out to me to say, you know what, that one, that's not, uh, that's not um, honor. That's actually pride. And Paul did that for the Corinthians. First Corinthians 4, 6. And these things, brethren, are by writ in a figure, transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. In other words, this is for your advantage, that you may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. So you, as a believer, you must learn to reason in line with the word of God. Learn to, see, when it even comes to your own self, think of yourself in line with the word of God. Don't think of yourself in line with your feelings. Don't think of yourself in line with your preferences. Think in line of the written word of God. Amen. Think in line with the written word of God. It says, you, it says that you may learn in us not to. You know, bless God, that's what Paul taught. Because, you know, in our day, we have a strange, weird, pseudo, false kind of humility, which takes the man and elevates him above the word of God. And then, then the Christians wonder, why am I not growing? Why am I looking? Why is it that things are not that smooth in my spiritual growth? Right? Why is it that it looks like my uh, comprehension of spiritual truth is slowing down? Let me say it again. Whenever men start elevating men above the word of God, their grasp of revelation knowledge begins to fail. Their grasp of revelation knowledge begins to dwindle. Because the heart full of pride cannot be uh, magnifying the word of God. To magnify the word of God, I must repent, which means I agree with the word. And so I use the word to understand me. And I use the word to understand my leader. My leader should be honored. No, my leader should be honored as the word def defines honor. So see it again. First Corinthians 4, 6. I have enough figure God transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you will be puffed up one against another. So it is pride. So let's get it right. As a believer, you must, you must do your utmost best in your own private study life to ask yourself, this thing I am, I am having towards this man, is it biblical honor or is it fear, which is pride? Because they look alike. When you See, you can't judge honor by just action. People make that mistake. You don't know honor by action, although honor will result in action. Be, be clear about this. Honor, real honor, will result in certain actions. But you cannot judge by the action, judge honor. Honor is of the heart. It's an esteeming issue. And the esteeming is, I take everybody, including me, and I subject us to the word of God. Then the journey starts. Amen. Now, I want to see something. That the, let's go back to the first Corinthians one again. In, in Corinth, they were trying to create an artificial war between the Apollos group and the Paul group. Although Paul and Apollos did not create the group, right? Instead, they were like, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And then Paul just cut through that and say, who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos? What minister by whom you believed? 
Simple. And in fact, you know what? You ought to learn from Paul, learn from Apollos. Why? In fact, look at 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 then says, it says in verse 21, Therefore, let no man glory in men. Hey, 21 again. Therefore, let no man glory in men. My dear friend, is it that Paul did not want them to honor him? He wants them to honor him. You see, when you obey the word, you are honoring men. Uh, right? See, to honor God's word, in the honor of God's word, you find real honor for men. Yeah? But outside of God's word, you are best practicing the tradition of your elders or the weirdness of our society. But there is a society in God. There's a society in the epistles. There's a society in the new creation, in the new birth. There's a society in the resurrection of Christ. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So 1 Corinthians 3.21, Paul said, Therefore, let no man glory in men. All things are yours. What is it referring to? Paul, Apollos, Cephas, world, life, death, things present, things to come, all are yours. And, are, and you are Christ and Christ is God's. Can you see? It, it ends up with Christ. Right? It ends up with Christ. But here's the point. All these things are yours. All these ministries are yours. In other words, rather than making yourself a slave of a clique, you are to receive, let, let me say it again. God gives men to us as gifts. The, uh, the lust of the flesh turns God's gifts to a clique. And in turning to a clique, a blessing becomes a curse. Why? Because now we are unable to receive the word of God because we are totally taken over by men. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.21, let no man glory in men. Underline that in your Bible. Oh, somebody says, does that mean that we do not regard men? No, now. See, the Paul that talked about highly esteeming ministers already told the Corinthians, let no man glory in men. What does it mean to glory in men? It is what the Corinthians were saying. Oh, me, I'm a Paul. Oh, me, I'm of Apollos. Me, I don't know about Peter. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Paul man. I'm an Apollos man. And, and what, did that, what did he call that? Canality. In other words, it is this honor that is unable to receive men as God's gifts to men. So what are you meant to look for? You are meant to look for the revelation of Jesus on the lips of the men. So if the men are planting and the men are watering and God is given the increase, what do you do? You receive the men. Simple. You receive the man. You don't say, no, 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 until the person I like says that Jesus rose from the dead. I'm not going to accept it. Then you are glorying in men. Do you understand? Let no man glory in men. Imagine, imagine what it would have been if the church in the days of, uh, uh, of James and John or Jude was, you have people that would say, I'm of Jude. And therefore, if Jude doesn't write it, I'm not going to accept it. You know, that, that means you are just left with one book of the Bible. Then you see all of Paul's letters and you see John's letters and James's letters and, and you just not read them. Why? Because that is pride. Pride cannot recognize revelation knowledge. It is caught up with men and it's glorying in men and the man they glory in is not the one that died for them. And that therein lies the trouble. Do you get the point now? But here's the point I'm trying to say. I went into all that to say this. Paul said this, speaking to the people in Corinth as brethren. Hallelujah. He spoke to them as brethren. Now, this, see, verse 22, 1 Corinthians 3, 22, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things, or things to come, all are yours. See, that scripture is about ministry. It doesn't mean that somebody else's car is yours. It doesn't mean that somebody else's wife is yours. It just means the ministry, God-given ministries are yours for you to see the revelation of God in Christ in them. Amen. Now, see, you want to listen to the things we're talking about tonight and listen to them rather well because I'm trying to be as simple as possible, right? That because there's a thin line between honor and what, uh, and what men call honor and what is not honor. Is honor important? Yes. The minister honors the saints. The saints honor the minister. The, saints hold the, the minister holds the saints sacred and the, and the saints hold the minister sacred. The sacred treatment of the uh, of the minister by the saints is that they will receive from the saints the word of God, from the minister the word of God, and they will subject that minister to God's word. Look at Galatians, Galatians and chapter one and verse eight. Paul said, "But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, 
yeah, unto you than that which you have, which, which we have preached unto you. Let him be a cause. That means don't touch, don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. As we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, let him, let, that you have received, let him be a cause. You know what? You use what you've received. You use the word of God. You use the revelation of Jesus to know what to receive from men. And Paul said, even if I do that, you mustn't take it. If what I'm saying is not in line with what you know to be the revelation of Christ, then you don't take it, right? What are you doing? You are subjecting the minister to the revelation of Jesus. You are subjecting the angel to the revelation of Jesus. You are subjecting yourself to the revelation of Jesus. You are subjecting your preferences to the revelation of Jesus. Let me tell you the truth. There are just some men that your heart opens to more than others. Maybe you like their mannerisms, their styles, their way, their diction. You like their jokes, the way they crack it. You like the way they move their hand and their body. You just like their total mien or approach. It's true. But you, you submit all that at the altar of revelation knowledge. All those things are secondary to the truth of God's word. Amen. All those things. So go back to 1 Corinthians 16. Well, I said all that. So <laughs> look at 1 Corinthians 16. So having, they were trying to create a problem between Apollos and artificial problem that didn't exist. In verse 12, 1 Corinthians 16, 12, as touching our brother Apollos, glory to God. So Paul at the end told them, you know what, guys? Apollos is my brother, my friend. As, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desire him to come unto you. Stop and listen carefully. Who is Paul? Uh, uh, what did Paul say about Apollos? In first, on himself, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, and, uh, and then verse 6 or verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So there are gifts given to you in Christ. Verse 6, I have planted, as his ministry. Apollos has watered. Good stuff? Now go to, so we know that Apollos is a minister. When he comes around, he teaches. Good? Now look at 1 Corinthians 16. It then says in uh, verse 12, it says, as touching our brother, glory to God. Pay attention to that. What is it about Apollos that Paul magnified, our brother? What is it about Paul that Peter magnified, our beloved brother? What is it about Titus that Paul magnified to the Corinthians, my brother Titus? Can you see? It is because a man is a brother that he has the right to sit among us for starters that allows him to preach. Let me tell you the truth. If I was a herbalist, that means if I was not a saint, Right? Even if there's brimstone and fire, and I'm spewing out liquid fire, right, out of my mouth, right, you will not pay attention to me simply because I'm not a brother. You see, our end, what allows us to enter through the door and then gain the influence to talk to you is that we are brethren. Hallelujah. We are brethren. And then what kind of brethren are we? We are brethren that set examples for other brethren. So Peter, therefore, will call Paul our beloved brother Paul. He wasn't belittling Paul. He, he wasn't. Peter was not dishonoring Paul by calling him brother. Somebody says, ah, ah, you called Paul brother. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Brother is not a, a dish. Brother is not uh, a disgrace. Brother is what Jesus is not ashamed of. He says, wherefore he is not ashamed to call us brethren. <laughs> Glory to God. He's not ashamed to call us. So in 1 Corinthians 16, 12, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you. Please watch. Now, if Paul wants Apollos to come, what do you suppose Apollos is coming to do? To plant. So let me ask you, was the ministry of Apollos to the Corinthians accepted by Paul? Yes. In fact, Paul greatly desired Apollos to come to the Corinthians and minister to them. And he wanted Apollos to come just as the other brethren, the other ministers came to. Let me ask you again, what was the problem at Corinth? That they had Apollos and Paul and Peter? No. Paul actually still greatly desired after all the explanation, he said he was greatly desiring that Apollos would come with the other brethren, which are the other ministers. They refer to the ministers here as brethren. So, so Paul did not say that Apollos, that, let me say it one more time, because I, 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 I hear people uh, say this kind of stuff. Oh, that uh, when you listen to more than one person, then you'll be confused. No, when you listen to such ideas, you will be confused. 
Now, Paul said that as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired. So Paul wanted Apollos to come to minister. Paul's challenge was, you must not magnify Apollos above the word of God. You must you get to relate to Apollos in such a way that you abandon gospel common sense. Yeah, in other words, aka sound doctrine. So as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desire. Praise God. I greatly desire. So in other words, Paul felt that the ministry of Apollos was a ministry that the Corinthians should receive. In fact, he so magnified Apollos' ministry, he said, I planted. Apollos watered. I'm telling you that it means that Apollos and I are in the same work. So as touching, you know what, what are we saying? As a believer, never get into cliques. Never get into, somebody said, but they had companies. What was their company? They went, they, they came and they prayed together. When they came together and asked, they weren't doing, ah, we are of uh, uh, Peter, we are not of John. No, they just came together and they prayed together. Our company is not our clique. Clique is flesh, company is spirit. Company is we accept each other as gifts and we receive from one another for edification, for the propagation of the gospel. Click is we separate where there's no separation. We make distinctions where there is none. We create artificial barriers that prevent brother from working with brother. We create the kind of enmity or fights or, or the kind of stuff that happened in current until they began to even take each other to court, right? So that is click. Click doesn't see another believer as a brother for whom Christ died. Click sees our group, we, us, we are different from them. And they're talking about people for whom Christ died. That's click. Do you understand? So we are not clicky. We're people of a company. There are many companies in our company. But uh, the companies in our company is simply an efficient way of edifying one another. Definitely all the Christians in England cannot gather together every time to edify one another. So we'll have companies. But, but we are in companies only because that's an efficient way to do it. Not because, aha, the way we are, they are different from us. When that happens, that's click. Click and company. It's not semantic, so there's a whole lot of mindset about it. You see the Corinthians, that's click. You see the post correction, that's company. So Paul would then tell them, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you. Amen. It is healthy. Paul healthily recommended uh, uh, Apollos. And when Apollos was not coming, he let the Corinthians know. You know why he let the Corinthians know? Because he knows the tendency of the Corinthians. But before long now, these guys will be saying, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos. And they will just bring their uh, uh, small heads into a big matter. Let me say it again. As touching our brother Apollos, I love that. Our brother, our brother. What a marvelous day it will be when the first thing you think about when you see another believer is that's my brother, that's my sister. You see, and my sister is about to preach the word of God. I'm going to listen with rapt attention. I'm going to give it all my absorbing energy. Something beautiful happens at that point in time. So as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time. Notice, Paul did not say it was not God's will for him to come. Can that be the case? Yes. Was that the case here? No. So, you know, these guys talk about themselves in terms that made you know they were human. His will was not to come. In other words, Paul could not bend Apollos' will. Paul tried to persuade him. He desired greatly. Apollos thought, no, I shouldn't come now. And that's the way Paul said it. You know, Paul didn't say with malice. Uh, don't, don't worry about that Apollos guy. I don't know who he thinks he is. He owed me. I was begging him. And he wouldn't come. You know, you all, anyway, you all know him. Now, when we talk that way about one another, that's troublesome. He says, no, as touching our brother Apollos, see, see the wonder. You know, let me say it again. The new creation must remain a wonder, a miracle to you. The believer is such a phenomenon that you must learn to look at yourself as the phenomenon of the gospel. And then learn to then look with the same eyes at another believer and look at them as the trophy of the grace of God. So Paul said here, as touching our brother Apollos, our, you could see the pride. Uh, well, what did I say pride there? I mean, you could see the excitement in Paul as he spoke about Apollos, our brother. Ooh, our brother Apollos. Uh, you know, some people have gotten angry with that. He said, no, no, no. I am the apostle, senior, prophesying, prophet, evangelist, Apollos. And there is your brother. That brother is for all those guys that got born again. No. I was touching our brother Apollos. I greatly desired him to come. 
unto you with the brethren. But his will was not to come at this time. Simple. And he will come when he shall have the convenient time. In other words, I thought it was convenient for him to come. He didn't think it was convenient for him to come. When he finds it convenient, he will come. That is the way we talk about one another. We don't second guess. We don't assume the worst. We don't, you know what is funny? I, I like, you could tell that Paul was the one that was more authoritative in the Corinthian church. But look at the way Paul used godly authority. He didn't go to start telling them some bad, he wasn't bad mouthing Apollos behind them. You know, there's this strangeness you see among saints who bad mouth each other behind their backs. And then when they see each other, they say, ah! See what new creation, yay, redemption. Oh, glory to God, glory, glory. And then we use glory to kill each other. <laughs> no, we don't do that. We don't do that. If a brother is out of order, tell him to his face. Why you love him? That's the faithful wound of a friend. You don't go about bad mouthing a brother in the local assembly or a brother's full stop or sister full stop to other Christians. Then, when you see the man, you not tell him, Ah, uh, you're a correct guy. And then, you understand, we don't do that. We, look at Paul. Paul and Apollos, the people who are trying to create a contention. Now, mind you, Paul is unlike many of us today. If it's many of us today, we will be the one telling them, ah, how can you put me on the same level with Apollos? Do you not know that one of my disciples in Acts 18, Priscilla and Aquila, were the ones that sat Apollos down and they put him through the gospel? Apollos, little boy there, I taught him gospel. Apollos was, he was nothing before. I was one that taught him. I taught him, I taught his theta teacher, and I taught the Greeks Greek. And now I'm telling you that, who is he? Who is he? He doesn't know what he's talking about. No, we don't do that. We don't talk that way. So is it say, do Christians talk that way? Okay, call it figure of speech. But let me tell you now. As touching our brother Apollos, our brother, our sister, hallelujah, our sister Priscilla, our brother Apollos, Amen. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desire him to come unto you. Amen. That's healthy. I greatly desire him to come unto you. Yeah. With the brethren. But what his will was not to come at this time. Let me say it again. Never try to, as a minister, as a pastor, as a shepherd, don't spiritualize that which should not be spiritualized. In fact, I say differently. It is spiritual to let matters be as they are or to state matters as they are. You understand? So let's say differently. So Apollos was did not want to come yet. That's all. The spiritual thing is to say he didn't want to come yet. It will now be unspiritual to say, ah, how can we just tell them Apollos was not willing and I wanted him to come? Are, are we saying that Paul was not in the spirit? Don't add spirits to that. It was just a thing of I desired and he wasn't willing. Simple. So how do we state it? I desired, he wasn't willing. When he's willing, he will come. And that ends it. Amen. He ends it and it makes it so easy. Let me say it again. First Kings. No, first Samuel. Huh. First Samuel. And chapter 15. Verse 24. 23. It says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So if you have a book and you're writing down, you write, rebellion equals witchcraft. Good. So don't assume you know what witchcraft is. Though. Witchcraft is nothing other than rebellion. Now, what is rebellion? Let's watch. Stubbornness uh -huh, is as iniquity and idolatry. So the sin of idolatry is stubbornness. Just like the sin of witchcraft is rebellion. So when a rebellious person is in witchcraft, a stubborn person is an idolatry. Now, how do you know rebellion and stubbornness? It's very easy. Someone is talking. Pay attention. This is a worthy prophet. He said, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. Okay. So what is, who is a stubborn believer? A stubborn believer who is in the scene of idolatry is a believer that does not prioritize the word of God rejects the word of God, does not give the word of God first place. That's all. That's stubbornness. So good thing stubbornness is when you stick with God's word. No, you are expected to stick with God's word. Yeah? You are meant to be immovable in God's word. In God's word, right? Immovable in God's word. 
when you are not persuaded in God's word, you're not persuaded. When the word of God has built persuasion in you, it has built it. That one is not stubbornness. That is you holding fast, right? And you should do that. But there's stubbornness often, and it doesn't look like stubbornness. It's simply the rejection of the word of God. On a matter, the word of God says something, and the man follows the tradition of men. That is stubbornness, which is rebellion. That is the witchcraft that is idolatry. He says, because you rejected the word of the Lord, you are rejected, uh, uh, he has rejected thee from being king. In other words, Saul, who was the king of Israel, who was and the king is meant to be a teacher of the law. The king is meant to be somebody that uh, takes the revelation of Moses and teaches it to the people. He lost his right to teach it to the people because he rejected that word. He would not prioritize the word of God, and that is witchcraft. So when, when the Bible says, who has bewitched the Galatians, it's easy. A minister that does not prioritize the word of God will bewitch because the person is practicing witchcraft. So witchcraft does not often have uh, like um, a voodoo stick that is pricking a door. No. No. Witchcraft often sounds eloquent. It's often open in the Bible, but not saying what the word of God says. It's rejecting the word and elevating men. What, now, why, look at what Samuel, uh, Saul then said. He says in verse 24, And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and your words, because I feared the people. So the fear of man, right, often, let me say it again, when you are afraid of people, it will lead into idolatry and lead into rebellion and it will lead into stubbornness. Let me say it again. In other words, the most stubborn people are often unable to call themselves stubborn. That's what is strange. Now, people think that if you find somebody like Paul who says, this is the truth of scripture, we will not allow any other thing. Say, hey, Paul is a stubborn man. No, that is a humble man. <laughs> the stubborn man is the man that when uh, the group that says, circumcision is the correct thing, come. He will say, circumcision is the correct thing. And another group says, don't circumcise. You say, ah, don't circumcise. Someone will say, ah, what kind of man he is? Ah, he knows how to just blend. No, he's stubborn. Why is he stubborn? In that he abandoned the word of God. He's actually a witch. And he's into idolatry. Let me say it again. As a believer, I never want to be found practicing witchcraft or idolatry. You see, idol so because of our interesting ways of thinking, many people think that idolatry is when you have a man with uh, palm fronds uh, tied around his waist and is dancing to some uh, mystical tunes and dancing around the mosquito or dancing around the grasshopper and or dancing around uh, a bushfire and then they are singing and they are dancing and sweating. They say, ah, look at this fetish man. But the greatest fetish is the fetish that happens in the local assembly where a man is opening the word of God, but really not opening it, right? A man is opening the Bible, but the minds of men are closed, right? Men are being made to abandon the word of God. Like we said in Galatians 2 yesterday, with the moment when Peter, in Galatians 2, 11, yeah, abandoned gospel, and out of fear, like Saul, out of fear for some big boys, click, just click, look at it again, Galatians, go back to Galatians. Galatians. So, my dear friends, don't be clicky. Be a man given to company. Keep good company. Excellent company. Keep good manners in the gospel. There are some things that are bad manners in the, uh, uh, among saints, and there's good manners. It is good manners to keep correct, correct company. Yeah, men that uh, men that prioritize the love work and the word of God. Now, it says here in uh, uh, Galatians two verse eleven. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before the Satan came from James, he did eat with the Gentile. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing, can you see? Fearing them which were of circumcision. What was his action? He withdrew. Why did he withdraw? Fear, right? So where was the fear? Inside or outside? Inside. So the fear was invisible. The product of the fear was visible, right? Now, so the, and what was that? Rebellion and witchcraft. Somebody said, what? Did you just say Peter was in witchcraft? Yes, that's witchcraft. Why is it witchcraft? What is witchcraft, right? He is manipulating and controlling and making people do things that are contrary to the word of God. That's just witchcraft. That's like a voodoo doll. Press you, ah! Yeah, massage you, hey! 
you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> That's the witchcraft. So when a man is able to influence me against the word of God, that is witchcraft. When a man is able to make me reason, right, against God's word, take a stand opposite to God's word, that man has successfully gotten me into idolatry. The man is an idolater, the woman is an idolater, and the man or woman, the minister, has gotten me into idolatry. Let me say it again. You know, when I say, when I'm preaching in this series, please don't think I'm talking about some uh, pope, pope, uh, the Pope in Rome. I'm talking to you. I'm anticipating that you see yourself as a teacher of men, an instructor of men. Now you see yourself as I should have disciples. I should have those that I train, that I bring up in the nurture and the admonition of the law. That's what I mean. So when we say this, I'm saying you. Don't think about some big man somewhere. I'm talking to you. So you are going to be somebody not given to witchcraft because witchcraft is stubbornness, idolatry. What is the stubbornness? A man insisting against God's word. A man taking a stance against God's word. He will rather please men than be found on the side of God's word. You know, and I'm telling you, except you give yourself to prayer and to being persuaded in the word, it is so easy to abandon the word and to be clicky with men. Let me say it again. Funny enough, men need men, but we don't need cliques. We are is set the solitary in families. So in the local church, we are in a family, not in a clique. You know, it's very funny. You know, sometimes the very illustrations we use to explain family make it sound a bit more like a mafia. No, we are not the mafiosi. We are not uh, the, the uh, East London gang on the, or, or the underworld. We are the church of the firstborn. All that we do is just because we care. About, says, Bible says, let nobody should mind his own things, but the things of others. Let this mind be in you, Philippians 2, that was in Christ Jesus. So be other people-minded. Not nosy, but other people-minded. That means their welfare, their edification is important to you. So Barnabas was caught away in the acting or in the voodoo. See, let me tell you, there is no voodoo as effective as church voodoo. Let me see one more time. There is no voodoo as effective as church voodoo because... The way many of us do church, right? People don't need the devil again. There's no need for the devil. The devil can successfully go on holiday given the way many saints relate to other saints. There's no need for any devil because the saints in their actions are all the devil the other saints need. But no, we are not devil-minded people. We are God in dwelt. We are spirit in dwelt. We are the people of God's love. We are born of God. The love of God is in us in that the spirit of God is in our hearts. So we love like God's love. We have brotherly love in our hearts. We let the brotherly love continue. We are totally intoxicated with the reality of brotherhood in Christ. Amen. With the reality of brotherhood in Christ. That's what we are. Very important. Now, so as saints, the stuff that motivates us, right? The stuff that motivates us is the fruit of brotherhood. Now, I got into all that to say this, right? Uh, if you notice, I've been staying on brother, brother, brethren, 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 brethren. And in Hebrews 2, he's not ashamed. Hebrews 2, look at it quickly. Hebrews 2, he's not ashamed. Hebrews 2 and verse uh, 11. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So we also are not ashamed because he's not ashamed. See, if he's not ashamed of me, then there's no shame of the brotherhood as a gift in Christ. Let me say it again. Shame of the brotherhood is not a gift in Christ. Shaming Christians is not a gift in Christ. We are not ashamed of the brotherhood. Think about this carefully. How can Jesus identify with you? And then why wouldn't you want to identify with another believer? Let me say it again. You know, we are quite interesting people, I keep saying it that we create excuses for ourselves. Uh, you know, I was listening to, so, to some man talk the other day and said, ah, well, all of us, we have our mistakes. And because we have our mistakes, we are men. We have to learn to accept one another. And then the same man is then talking of, of another Christian. Look, well, on account of his mistake, he, we cannot accept him in our midst. Ah, wait, wait. But we should accept you for your mistakes, but not accept that guy or that girl for his mistake, for our mistake. No. No, you see, there's something fundamentally warped about that. We are brethren. And because we are brethren, let me tell you again, you, you, there's an example we see in Christ Jesus. He took time 
to choose his disciples, it, the bar was high. And once he chose them, my God, he let them get away with all sorts. I don't know, but sometimes I'm ashamed for Jesus. <laughs> you know, you read what Peter did and what James did and the kind of squabbles and arguments they have amongst them and he boldly associated with them. And I asked myself, would I? But I should. I should. You see, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. You only have to remember you in order to know that if he is not ashamed to call me brother because of the work he did in redemption, then I see his work in other men and I'm not afraid or ashamed to call them brethren. Amen. Now, let me read you a piece of scripture before we go tonight. I know that time has gone. Look at Hebrews and chapter 13. Hebrews 13. I'm going to jump all the way to verse 17 now. So Hebrews 13, 17, what does it say? Hebrews 13, 17 says, uh, Obey them which have the rule, I'm reading the King James Version, Obey them which have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. Now, we, we've said that that word obey, yeah, is not the same obedience as to an authority. No. Is there obedience to authority? Even in the uh, 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 thought in the Bible. Yes. But Hebrews 13, 17 is teaching brotherly love, which is a particular kind of obedience. In fact, that word obey there is a misnomer. I don't know why the King James called it obey because it's a word that really means, uh, um, well, scholars say this, that the, uh, you see, when um, you, you read the Greek, you have the mood, you have the tense, you have the, well, let's leave it aside. The word obey there is, a, the, the, the scholars say the better way to translate it is, let yourself be persuaded by. That's the, that word obey. Let yourself be persuaded by. So who is the owners on? You. Not them. Not the one that has the rule, but me in my relationship to the one that has the rule. My leader, right? My pastor has the rule. Moreover, we explain that rule. You see, the rule of Christ, the reign of Christ is in the heart of men and it is a service to men. Someone said, but Jesus commands us. I'm telling you, even that command, it does it as a service. Now, so Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you. That word obey them is not the same thing as in Hebrews 5, 9, where it says that uh, he's the author of, uh, he's a author of eternal salvation. Yeah, to them that obey him. That word obey, in obey him there, is actually a word which means to come under an authority. Obey. Which is what we understand by, we normally think about obey. But obey in Hebrews 13, 17 is let or allow or permit yourself to be persuaded by. By who? Them that have the rule over you. Submit. What is submission? Letting yourself be persuaded by. So submit yourself to their persuasion. That's what he's saying. Submit yourself to their persuasion. Let yourself be persuaded by. Or let yourself be convinced by. Let yourself become confident in. See, that word also means confidence. In other words, that person is saying, ah, develop confidence in your pastors. It, it doesn't make sense for you to be in a local assembly over a period and you are still mistrusting your pastor. Somebody is wrong. Somebody is wrong, not only with the pastor, but with you. Because that's what Paul is talking about. So I said, Paul, sorry. I don't believe Paul wrote Hebrews, by the way. But that's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about there. Yeah, uh, it, it, uh, it says, let yourself be persuaded by. Let yourself, the writer says, let yourself be persuaded by. Right? So you are all meaning, let us become confident in. So I am responsible for developing confidence in my pastor. Say it again. The pastor is not responsible for forcing confidence out of me. The pastor is not beating me into shape. Whether you like it or not, you must let me persuade you. No. Uh, let me say it again. Even if you use the word submit, there is an interesting thing about biblical submission. Biblical submission is always written to the one who is to do the submission. Biblical submission is never addressed to the one to receive it. 
it is it is written to the one to give it so if you are the one to submit you read everywhere you say submit uh, as an instruction in the epistles it is written to you who is to submit to another not to that other who is to receive your submission you get the point now so biblical submission is a gift that you give is a gift you give to the one who is to be a recipient of your submission in this case the submission is to persuasion. You are submitting to the person's ability to use the word of God to persuade you. You are developing confidence in that. Right? And you are developing confidence in your pastor. Praise God. That, that was talking about that. Right? You are allowing yourself to trust, to assent to, to rely on. Right? It, it means you are following that person. You see, there's a following in verse 7. Look at verse 7 here. Verse 7 says, follow uh, verse 7. It says, whose faith follow? That following is now described as a following based on persuasion. So you are following their persuasion. Praise God. Now, who is the ruler? The pastor. What does it mean to rule? To serve. Who is the servant? The pastor. Who is the served? The saint. So the pastor serves the saint with ministry. Then the saint responds to the persuasion of the pastor. You get it? Now it is. It's actually not complex. Pastor serves the saint, which is called rule. But serves the saint. When is he called rule? When is the word of God? Right? So the rule of the pastor is, is administration of the word of God by teaching and by precept. Or that's, that means by example. Now, what do I do? I receive my pastor's ministry to me. That act of receiving my pastor's ministry to me with a whole lot of excitement. And with a right heart, now the Bible calls honor, which in Hebrews 13 is called brotherly love. Amen. Okay, now, so the, let, let me say it again. You, you are to, on, that means that, the, that my submission to my pastor's persuasion is a gift I give my pastor. Just like my pastor's ministry to me is a gift he gives me or she gives me. So what am I giving to my pastor? My submission to my pastor's persuasion as he or she teaches the word of God. My submission to the pastor's persuasion in the opening of scripture. What is the pastor's gift to me? The pastor is giving me service. I am receiving. So I'm receiving service. The pastor is receiving my attention. Amen. Is that clear? So now this is very important. Uh, uh, when the pastor is demanding the submission. We are no longer talking about submission. Why? Biblical submission is a gift of the will affected by the word. So I'm a Christian, the word of God has affected me, and then I give my will to that other person, and that is called submission. It's a gift. If that other person is manipulating me, cajoling me, and trying to coerce me, it's no longer a gift. Now, I want to see it again. It says in verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. So the pastor is ministering to your inner life. They watch for your souls, as they that must give account. Uh -huh. Now, they must give account, watch carefully, that they must, they must give account. Now, so somebody says, well, so that means that the pastor is going to go to God and say, Pastor, Seku is not listening to me. No, that's not what the give account is. Yeah, no, the, the, the pastor there is not going, uh, the pastor is ministering to the saint. So when it comes to saint, pastor ministers to saint, what is that giving account? Look at Second Corinthians, quickly. Second Corinthians and chapter five and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. Look at first Corinthians and chapter three. Yeah, in first Corinthians and chapter three, it says <clears throat> in verse eight, now he that planted, and he that watereth was that ministry. So I uh, won, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. So who is Paul and uh, who, uh, uh, who is Paul and who is Apollos? 
actually uh, accounting to, or who is Paul and Apollos actually giving an account to? They are giving an account, or they will give an account to the one that sent them on the errand. So it was God that told Jesus. So it was, it was Jesus that told Peter. He says, Peter, you love me? Feed my lamb. So Peter is accountable to Jesus to feed the lamb. So G Peter will give an account for how he discharged his ministry, whether he did it faithfully or not. <clears throat> Amen. Yeah, he will give an account whether he gave it faithfully or look at 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. For uh, look at verse 2. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. What's required? That they be found faithful. So there's somebody doing the finding, and what, when, they are, when they are examined, they will be faithful. Look at verse 3. But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yes, I judge on my own self. Verse 4. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. So therefore, judge nothing before the time. So until the Lord come. So judge nothing before the time. So when it says they give an account, who are they giving an account to? Hebrews, quickly. In Hebrews and chapter 13, who are they giving an account to? To the Lord. Yeah, they are giving an account to the Lord for the ministry that has been given to them to discharge. Now, how are they to do it? They are doing it with joy and not with grief. Now, in not, what is the grief? What, what will it be to do it with grief? It will be that rather than me submitting to their persuasion, I am aloof to their persuasion, and therefore I make a job that is already having a high standard harder. Let me say it again. My pastor is supposed to uphold a standard that is only matched by the sacrifice of Christ. It is a big pull a mighty responsibility. It is to be taken with the greatest gravity. Uh, and how do, I, uh, how do I relate to such men or women that have given themselves to the cause of a gospel? I obey, meaning I actually let myself be persuaded by them, right? Which is my submission to them. I let them persuade me in the word of God. What if I don't let them? I make their job harder. That is that's what it means by not with grief. Can you see? So when it says not with grief, it means you are, you are not supposed to make it harder. So you tell yourself, I don't make my pastor's job harder. I make it all the easier. I submit to persuasion. I submit to godly persuasion. I'm, a, I'm vulnerable to God's word. I'm vulnerable to sound counsel. I'm vulnerable to sound doctrine. I'm vulnerable to good example. I'm vulnerable to the love walk. I'm vulnerable to the spirit. Yeah, that's what you tell yourself. You are not going to make them do their work with grief because what is it with the, with the grief? They are, their persuasion is not received by you. Uh, now, now, get it right. When they persuade, I listen, I give them my attention, I give it my focus, I am judging and weighing and considering. But what if I don't judge? What if I don't weigh? What if I don't even listen? What, I, what if I make myself not persuadable? That is the grief. What happens? That is unprofitable for me. You get it now. So if I don't listen to my pastor's teaching, then I cannot get the profit of sound doctrine. So the teaching of God's word is meant to bring edification, illumination, clarity, spiritual growth. But if I don't receive it, if I'm not persuaded by it, if I'm not influenceable by it, one, I make the job harder for the guy teaching. And moreover to myself, that stuff is unprofitable for me. That activity of mine, of not submitting myself to solid persuasion, is not profitable for me in that I will not be edified, I will not be taught, I will not be instructed. Why? My slant of not being persuadable disqualifies me from receiving understanding. Look at it again, Ephesians. This is where Paul said in Ephesians, Ephesians 3 and verse 3. He says, uh, so verse 4, uh, so verse 3, how that by revelation it made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand. When you read, you may understand. Now, that word read there actually means you're going to give it your attention and your, you're going to give it all of the detail it requires. So it means if I don't read well, then I will not understand. 
If I don't read well, look at Second Corinthians. I, I want to see it is not a new concept. It, that means if you don't, the way you read Paul is the way you understand or not understand Paul. Second Corinthians and chapter three. Look at verse fourteen. Verse fourteen says it says, but their minds were blinded. Until this day, remained the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So when a man, how a man listens to the word of God, how a man reads the word of God, right, prevents the man from going on to understanding and edification or get, getting into understanding and edification. Amen. So we don't want the ministry of our leaders to be unprofitable for us because if we don't receive their ministry or we don't submit ourselves to their ability to persuade in the word of God, then sound doctrine will not be received by me and I will be blessed by it. But you know what? I'm blessed with my sound doctrine. I'm persuadable by good word. I listen to good men. I ponder what is taught unto me. I give you my absorbing energies and my thoughts and all that. I consider that and I follow faith. I consider their work and their lifestyle. I'm not led away onto dumb idols. I'm not led away onto uh, weird doctrines. I'm not led away onto fallacies and error. I am actually persuaded by the truth of God's word. I'm somebody who is given. Yeah, as I'm saying to myself, you say that about yourself too. You are given to being to allowing the word of God bend you, shape you, adjust you, uh, influence your mindset. You do not elevate men above God's word. You receive men as gifts in the word of God, and you allow the word of God train you in receiving those men correctly. Amen. Amen. What happens? Then it becomes profitable unto you. Praise God. Well, guys, it's a pleasure. List uh, bringing to you 